I'm reading from John chapter 14, verses 23 to 29. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. This morning's sermon is called Heaven Starts Here. Hopefully that'll make more sense later. But first, what do we mean by heaven? At the beginning of John chapter 14, the chapter today's reading came from, Jesus offers us this stunning picture of heaven. He says to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. So here Jesus talks about heaven like it is a spacious mansion that is somewhere else and that the disciples need to be transported to it by Jesus when he comes again. But in the book of Revelation, heaven is depicted differently. In our opening reading this morning, we heard about a heavenly city coming down to earth, a place where God dwells with his people. That picture is not so much of a mansion with rooms, but a city with open gates. And we don't go to it. It comes to us. So there are these two pictures that clearly contrast. And to make matters more complicated, Jesus preached in the Gospels, repent for the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God has come near. So there's this additional idea that wherever Jesus is, heaven is close. It's at hand. It's near. I could share with you even more pictures of heaven in the Bible, but we might become even more perplexed. So let's just stick with these ones and consider what links them together. What do we mean by heaven? Well, I can only see in part, but here's where I'm at. And it's really quite simplistic. I believe heaven is where God dwells. And what all those pictures have in common is God dwelling with us because God wants to dwell with us. And isn't that what the whole Bible is essentially about? In the first book of the Bible, Genesis, God somehow walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. And as we've seen in the last book of the Bible, God promises to dwell with his people in a beautiful city. And then in between humanity fall from this initial experience of closeness, but still God's presence is mediated through the law and the prophets glimpsed through wisdom and song, manifested in the tabernacle and temple. And all of this was fulfilled and surpassed in Jesus Christ, the word of God, who became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This is why we make such a big fuss about Christmas. It's a celebration of God being God with us, Emmanuel in Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible is all about. God wants to dwell with you. And God dwelling with us is heaven. So with that in mind, what has heaven got to do with your life now? If heaven is all about God dwelling with us and Jesus, God with us, has gone from this earth to prepare a place for us, how can we experience heaven today when Jesus is not here? Thankfully, this is the question Jesus explores with his disciples. Well, this is what he answers. He answers that question. He says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Let's just break that down a bit. So Jesus links love 
with obedience. He says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. I think that's really helpful. Jesus is saying that love of Jesus is not just a feeling or a well-meaning intention. Love of Jesus is acts of obedience to Jesus' commands, not least the new commandment to love like Jesus. We looked at that last week. And that helps us interpret obedience as well. Obeying Jesus is not some soulless rule keeping, but a wholehearted expression of love. And the result of all of that, Jesus goes on to explain, is that my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Which is not to say that the father didn't love them before, but the father is surely delighted, pleased, thrilled when his children obey Jesus' commands and love like Jesus. And when that happens, the father and son make their home with the disciples in a special way. If heaven is where God dwells, then Jesus is saying something absolutely extraordinary. He's saying heaven starts here. You don't have to wait for the father's house. You don't have to wait for death. You don't have to wait for the kingdom to come wherever And whenever you obey Jesus out of a love for him, the father and son dwell with you in a way that anticipates the closeness to God you will enjoy in heaven. And of course, we still hope for the kingdom of God, the kingdom of shalom, peace to come in fullness, something that God will establish. But heaven starts here because when God is delighted by our active love, God will come to dwell with us. And that is heaven. And this taste of heaven, it's backed up by two further gifts, the Holy Spirit that will come to teach and remind us of Jesus' teaching and Jesus' peace that is more wholesome than the peace of the world. Even if all the other aspects of shalom peace are lacking, Jesus offers us shalom peace with God, shalom peace with him, and that is heavenly. So what has heaven got to do with your life now? Absolutely everything. Heaven starts here. Heaven is knocking on your door. God's always ready to delight in you and dwell with you. All of this reminds me of a scene in a novel called The Brothers Karamazov by the Russian writer Dostoevsky. And stick with me here because this is good stuff. Early on in the novel, a monk, fictional monk, called Father Zosima has a conversation with a lady of little faith But what is interesting about this lady of little faith is that she has plenty of faith in God. What she struggles to believe in is heaven. All she can think about is that when she dies, there'll be nothing, absolutely nothing. And so she's anxious and terrified and she comes to Father Zosima for counsel. He says to her that one cannot prove heaven, but one can become convinced of it by the experience of active love. He says this, try to love your fellow human beings actively and untiringly. In the degree to which you succeed in that love, you will also be convinced of God's existence and of your soul's immortality. Then they have this fascinating conversation about how tricky it is to actually love people. Have you found that? Have you found loving people tricky at all? The Lady of Little Faith, she says that she has big dreams of giving everything up to nurse sick people and devote her life to that. And at first she thinks that that dream makes her a loving person, but she soon admits that her love would soon go cold if her patience were ungrateful or if the love was not reciprocal, it was not two-way. That reminds Father Zosima of a man he once knew whose love for humanity kept apparently growing while his love for particular people diminished. The man dreamt of giving his life up for humanity's sake, but in real life, he couldn't spend two days in the same room as someone else. His big dream of love didn't match up with his practice of love. The lady of little faith is ready to despair at this point, but Father Zosima commends her. He commends her for her self-awareness and encourages her to never lie to herself. It's good that she realises how her grand commitments to love are little more than a daydream. And so he leaves her with these words. I regret I can say nothing more cheerful to you for in comparison to fanciful love, active love is a cruel and frightening thing. Fanciful love thirsts for a quick deed swiftly accomplished and that everyone should gaze upon it. 
Active love, on the other hand, involves work and self-mastery, and for some, it may even become a whole science. But I prophesy to you that at the very moment that you behold with horror that in spite of all your efforts, not only have you failed to move towards your goal, but even seem to have grown more remote from it, at that very moment, I prophesy to you, you will suddenly reach that goal and discern clearly about you the miracle working power of the Lord, who has loved you all along and has all along been mysteriously guiding you. I don't normally quote at length from a novel in a sermon, but I think this fictional monk's words are very insightful. The love that Jesus commands is not the love of our daydreams. It's an active love for particular people who are not always grateful and not always lovable. Sometimes the only reason we will love is out of an obedience to Jesus. And what's more, we often fall short of that love. But Father Zosima says that it's right there in the practice of it that we find God coming alongside to help us towards our goal. And it's this divine assistance, divine accompaniment in the frightening work of love that makes heaven real to us. Heaven starts here. When you are self-aware enough to know you cannot love as you must love, and yet miraculously you do the loving thing anyway, you know that it must be the Holy Spirit that's leading you and you get a glimpse of the peace of Christ. And that is truly a taste of heaven. Heaven starts here. In this final part of the sermon, I wonder if we could come at this from a, another angle. There are some famous words about love in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 13. They're often read at weddings. Love is patient, love is kind. You've heard those, right? Well, later in that chapter, we read this, love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. My understanding of those verses is that a lot of what goes on here will pass away when the kingdom comes in fullness. In Hebrews, it talks about all shakable things being shaken so that only the unshakable will be left behind. Real love, Christ-like love, is one of those things that is unshakable. Heaven is made of the stuff. God's kingdom is made of the stuff. God's future for us is made of the stuff. And so there's this direct link between love in action here and heaven. Every time you love someone as Jesus loves, you are building with the building blocks of heaven. You are circulating the currency of heaven. If love remains, if love never fails, if love endures forever, we cannot underestimate the significance of any truly loving thing on earth because it has a heavenly dimension. Heaven starts here. So to, to draw this together, heaven is where God dwells and God promises to dwell wherever and whenever people love Jesus and obey Jesus' new commandments. But real love is not as easy as dream love. We need to come to terms with our own inability to love so that we can be open to God coming alongside us to help us. And that help and its efficacy is truly a glimpse of heaven. And finally, love will remain Heaven is made of love. The future, God's future is love. And so everything we do has a potentially heavenly and eternal dimension. We can build with love, the building blocks of heaven right here, right now. So praise be to the triune God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. This God allows heaven to start here because this God wants to dwell with us. Praise be to that God. Amen.